you need to be able to connect with your story in such a way that when you share it, you own it. And so you come up from therapy, oh, I've, I've been discharged, whatever, I worked with abuse, and you're like, oh, but I can't hug my kids. Mm -hmm. I can't touch my kids, what's, what's going on, right? And so that's what makes this very challenging. And that's why when people say, well, aren't you over that yet? <laughs> It's like, well, if you only can understand how this works, then you probably wouldn't ask me that. Yeah, no, that's the first thing I tell I tell my clients. I'm like, your spouse, your significant other, your loved one is not your therapist. In disgrace, and I'm running down a hall of pain. At least I'm out of the rain, pouring rain. And again, oh, can I afford to cry? I paid the price for every lie. And I, for an eye, oh, I, oh, I. Hello, I'm Craig Hiding. Uh, welcome to a conversation with Thomas Edward, or Coach T, as he is known. I'm Laura Choi, and as most of us here today, Craig and I are survivors. Voices Beyond Assault lists these monthly programs because we understand that men who suffer sexual assault are not always hurt. We want to amplify their voices, empower them to heal, and provide the resources needed. And we're very excited today to be joining you from our podcast studios at Noya House in Hollywood, California, with our special guest, Brianna Redman, who's the founder of Voices Beyond Assault. Thank you, Brianna, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I am super thrilled to be here with you, too. Um, everything that you've done for men of EBA has been so amazing, and I'm so honored to be sitting here with the two of you and also with Mr. Thomas Edwards. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And we would just like to remind everyone that this program will contain discussions about emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. It may also include explicit language. The purpose of these programs is to put a spotlight on the healing journey specific to men. However, these programs are all inclusive as always. So let me introduce our special guest today who came all the way in from Sacramento. We're very excited to have you. Uh, Thomas Edward. Coach T. Thomas is the founder for of safeplaceformen.com. It's an amazing website, and he does amazing podcasts. I, I hope that you all go take a look and, and go take a listen. He's been a certified coach helping male survivors for over 23 years. Thomas is also a survivor himself, a certified hypnotherapist dedicated to helping male survivors focus on personal growth, transformation, and healing. Coach T's motto is let's release the past, embrace the future, and get love and connection. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today in Hollywood, driving all the way down from Sacramento to join us here today in this lovely studio. Mm -hmm. And thank you for all the incredible work that you've done with male survivors to become thrivers. Yeah, no, thanks for inviting me here. And uh, right now I'm just trying to calm myself after my morning of being locked out of my Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, the nerves are a little bit there, but we'll do fine. We'll do fine. <laughs> so, Thomas, I want to start by asking you, your motto starts with let's release the past. Yeah. In your work, how much do you focus on the actual abuse of the past? And and is that where it all starts or where does it go? Well, see, okay, so that's the great thing about, about coaching. Okay, so when I was doing my graduate study in psychology and counseling, um, I kind of made the decision that what I was going to do, I was going to focus a little bit more on the coaching perspective. I was already doing coaching anyway. And that was because what I noticed that most of the survivors that came to me, they would, they would report that like, look, I've been sitting in therapy for five, seven years, and we keep talking about the abuse over and over and over and over again, which is great. I understand that, but it's not moving me forward and where I want to go, right? And so then I approached it from a coaching perspective. So it's like, okay, so our goal is wherever you're at, 
move you forward, but we'll come back and pick up pieces of the past if we need to. Mm -hmm. So for example, when someone is, is, is working through, let's just say a CPTSD issue, and it's like, okay, we might do a little hypnotherapy, go back, find out kind of where that came from, and then move them forward. Right. And so that's the, the reason when I'm working with someone, the first question I ask them is, what does your healing vision look like? Mm -hmm. Right. And their mouths just drop. They're like, yes. no one ever asked me that in therapy. But I'm like, well, here's the thing about coaching. In order for us to figure out how to get you there, we got to know where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so I always started off with that. And also with the coaching, we can measure it. Right. So if you tell me what your vision is, we can always measure the milestones and see, well, how close are we getting to that vision of that piece of healing? Wow. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons that the coaching for me, and it, it works better. You know, for me, I like coaching um, better from that perspective because it's almost like, you know, I'm giving you assignments. You know, I call it growth work, not homework. <laughs> 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 it's called growth work. Yeah. It's called growth work. And then we can we can play with it, right? And so if there you have an obstacles, we can tweak it. So I can say, okay, so you know what made that assignment a little bit difficult for you? And then I could like, okay, so then let's try and tweak it this direction and see how that works. Because everyone is an individual, right? And so everything doesn't work for for everyone. And that's one reason coaching is great because I can pull in the integrative things that I've learned from other places also. That's such a unique uh concept and way to push to mm -hmm. thriving right yeah. because it's so like you know yes therapy is a, a great technique right. you know but there's something special about not living in your pain and your trauma mm -hmm. and actually having those conversations every week about that yeah. versus like how are we moving forward what yeah. do you want to see for yourself that's like very very unique and special so mm -hmm. thank you for that yeah yeah, no, but it's interesting just even from the perspective, though, because oftentimes therapists will send me clients and so they've been discharged, mm -hmm. right? And so it's great. So they figured that they've worked through the abuse, but they're like, oh, so now I'm dealing with these other issues of intimacy disorder. Well, I guess we're going to have time to address those in the therapy mm -hmm. session, right? I'm like, well, that's what we get to do here, right? And so you get to pick like, okay, so what's coming up for you now that you really want to focus on, let's just say whatever in the next six months, mm -hmm. right? And so then it's nice because you're getting buy-in because they're deciding what they want to work on. And that empowers them and gives them motivation because they pick and choose the things that they want to work on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I think you touched on something really important where you view people's abuse in history, not as their entire identity as their origin source, but as reference material. You say, yeah. hey, let's look back, let's check on this, see where it's at, and then come back. But sometimes when you focus on the abuse so much, it becomes part of your identity. You say, yeah. I am this thing. And I think that's a really beautiful thing that you touch on, where you say, this is just a part of who you are. This is an aspect, and there's so much more to you, things you want to do, things you want to be, healing visions that you want to do. Um, so I think that's really beautiful. But I want to kind of circle back a little bit. How did you come to this point where you are making, helping male survivors your life's work you know this is like really incredible work that you're doing in a very i would say a space that's maybe not the most explored <laughs> yes <laughs> I mean, well you know what they say right you know the um the wounded become the healers mm -hmm. right and so then you know me also being a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and i remember you know when i was kind of going through the therapy at, at first and this was, okay, I'm 57, right? So this is before, <laughs> this is like, you said 37? Telling our age. Everyone's 27 here. Yeah. Okay. So when I was coming on, there weren't many resources and stuff. And then you're sitting in the therapy room, and then they give you the ACE test, right? The adverse childhood, right? And they look at my, and they're like, you're off the chart. I'm like, yes, I'm off the chart. Well, why wouldn't I be off the chart? You know, I have nine perpetrators, whatever. Mm -hmm. In my story, you know, in my story, I have torture, right? So um, so I'll share with you one of my, I'm going to say, entrance points. So one of my entrance points, let's see, I was living in Seattle during that time. I can't remember if I was working for Microsoft or whatever at that point. So me and my roommate, we go and we see this movie. And I still remember the movie today, The General's Daughter mm -hmm. with John Travolta. And it was a case where they were trying to solve, and it was a, a criminal uh, sexual case. 
And so they get to the scene and they're trying to figure out how it happens. And they do these flashes of the person, they're tied to the bed, right? They're being tortured physically while they were being raped. And that was one of the scenes from one of my stories that right? just triggers me to hear it from. Yeah. 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 And so I jumped up. I mean, just all the stuff just come cascading at this, this one moment. And so I jump up out of the theater and I run the, the theater. And I'm just in this panic, whatever, whatever mode. And so it's interesting because I remember even, in, you know, in psychology and counseling class, they say, oh, you know, you know, if you have, you know, clinical depression it has to be three to six months and whatever, all these different types of things. That wasn't me. Like within one month, I was just spiraling downward, 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 downward. Uh, so as you can see, I don't fit the average. <laughs> <laughs> Not average. <laughs> and so I even re remember, it's like, okay, I've decided, I've got the suicide ideation, I don't want to be here anymore, the pain is too much, just not going to deal with it. Now, I'm a nice person, right, even from the perspective of protecting other people. And so I even, I even remember, so as I'm going around to my friends, I'm like, yeah, you know, I should go around and, you know, and just talk with each one, kind of my way of saying bye, but don't let anyone know what I'm going right. to, what I'm going to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so I get to the last person, this is Rowdy. And so Rowdy is there and I'm sitting there and he can tell that there's something, something wrong, whatever. Right. Yeah, he could tell there was something wrong. And so we're sitting there and then it just finally comes out, right? So I start sharing all this stuff. And so my body is going through like physical manifestations, you know, so it's like I got chills and fever all cause it's coming out, you know, as I say, the energy, the negative energy, is coming out and I'm crying. And uh, I know it freaked him out, but still, <laughs> you know, but he was, he was calm. He's like, man, I'm so sorry that, you know, that you were treated like that. You know, you just gotta, you just gotta remember, you know, that I love you don't, you know, don't. And so we're sitting there. So then I'm like, okay, I got all that out. Now I'm gonna go do the deed. I'm gonna go drive off a cliff. And so um, he's like, you know, I, it's been a long night. I think you should probably just stay here and, and sleep on the, on the couch, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, then you can you can go in the morning. And this is what he said to me. You know, I'm going to try not to cry. Um, he says, but when you wake up in the morning, he says, I want you to look at the picture, the family picture there of him as family. He says, what I want you to do, I just want you to remember that I love you. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. He says, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing he says, I just want you to remember that I love you. And so when I woke up that morning and I looked at the picture, the first thing I remembered was that he loved me. And that was my turn. Wow. Right. And so you'll notice on my podcast, I always at the end of it, I let people know that I do love them. And I know that's a hard word for us as survivors because we have this whole idea of what love is and what it isn't. Right. Sometimes I say I care for you. I'm concerned about you, but it's genuine, right? And there's something just about hearing those words and knowing that someone actually cares for you, right? And so that kind of set me on on that healing path, at least from the suicide ideation. That's, you know, when you're like, I don't want to cry, feel free to cry. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Crying <laughs> is purifying, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, um, it's something really special about sharing your story with someone and their response. Mm -hmm. Because the response is everything. Yes. It changes everything in you. Like it can either relax you, it can tense you up, it can make you never want to share that story mm -hmm. again. But to have someone that's there, like I hear you, I see you, I feel you, and I love you. Yeah. And I think he knew. Mm -hmm. He knew what your plans were that night. Mm -hmm. He's like, uh-uh. Yeah. And thank God for him for doing that because yeah. you have so much purpose mm -hmm. in this world. So I'm that was. So I want to talk about that and touch upon that sharing your story. Um, a lot of a lot of men in particular, and this, but this goes with both males and females. We wait a long time to share that story, mm -hmm. and we keep it within, and we don't share it. How important is it to share your story? And then I want to talk. I want you to talk a little bit about owning the story because there's a difference there, right? Yeah. Yeah. So sharing the story, I mean, it's it's part of the first step, right? And so it's crucial. So on that night when I when I shared that, 
that was great, but it was like, but the work is just beginning, right? And so when we talk about owning it, it's now, okay, so now that I've shared this, it's now taking those pieces and starting to work and process through those people and owning it, owning it. Oftentimes when I'm holding, you know, the workshops and stuff, and so we get to the point, uh, and there's, it's called disclosure, right? And so it's where everyone goes around and tells their story. But then you'll notice some people, and they'll go around and they'll tell their story like a robot. Mm -hmm. right because they haven't really connected with it they don't really own it and so they do what i call they minimize and they sanitize their story so they're cleaning up their story so oh it doesn't sound you know as bad or it wasn't that bad and they'll be using rationalization and justification and all these different type of things and the whole point is no you need to be able to connect with your story in such a way that when you share it you own it and that's why one of the reasons when I'm doing the workshops, I'm like, this might be the only place where you can put all the dirty, gritty, whatever details of what happened to you on the table and you're going to be accepted. So mm -hmm. don't miss that opportunity. And you'd be surprised what actually comes out because, wow, I can actually share like the nitty gritty stuff. Oftentimes, you know, so like <laughs> I even get this from like some of the spouses and significant others. They're like, I get it. My loved one was used, but I can't handle the details, mm. right? I can't handle the details. And so that's why I like to provide a place where it's safe mm -hmm. and the details can come out because the details need to come out, right? So you're owning that. But there's something about once you get those nitty gritty details out there and you know there's other people who are holding your story for you it starts to free you even yeah. more i think that's interesting because um i noticed like when you're doing speaking in public about your story and and we do want to spread awareness of mm -hmm. of uh sexual abuse as, as children even as adults we want to spread this awareness but um it depends on the audience and sometimes the uh the people when when i'm speaking they are like oh you know don't get into the gritty details. yeah and then you start doing that more and more and you stop owning your story yes and you start just being the robot and i, I just completely relate to that yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know I, I and unfortunately rape is brutal mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. sexual assault is brutal molestation is brutal and it's a, you know and unfortunately we have to be able to share those brutal details mm -hmm. in order for us to feel like we are able to release, yeah. you know, and just, oh, I got that off of me, yes. you know? Um, and then you can go into like the, you know, massaging the story a little mm -hmm. bit, but right. you have to be able to share that. And I feel like we should actually want people to really feel comfortable with sharing exactly what happened to them yeah. because even that, if it makes the people who are listening uncomfortable, uncomfortable because it should. Should. Yeah, should it should, should make them a thousand percent yeah good, good point yeah. but that's the reason i served that i saved that for the workshop because i i kind of have this theory at least for guys and it, like i said it goes back to my whole you know africa tribal mm -hmm. and trying to mimic some of the things that happens in that can place. you tell us about that though? um like that process and what you do yeah so it was it, it was just like okay so if if you go to african culture and, and things at least in, in the past what you'll notice is is that the if you want to say the tribal elders or the men would gather like in a circle and so in the circle was the place where you had the opportunity you know to speak whatever needed to be to be spoken it was the place where men healed men just like laura was talking about with his friends yeah hey, to go to the laundry yeah, yeah. that's that's exactly what it was but the thing was to be there in that circle and then to share whatever the you want to say the nitty-gritty stuff was a rite of passage mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that survivors are missing is the right passage right this thing that happened to you and now you're trying to figure out who am I, my masculinity, identity, these different type of things, it serves as a rite of passage. And you, you're creating the rite yes, of passage. Yeah. But I think it's something really transformative where you go through this terrible experience by yourself and now you share this experience in a moment of vulnerability and instead of going it alone, you are embraced and you're yeah. surrounded and you're loved and you are known. And yeah. that transformation, I think for a lot of survivors, is so fundamentally important to them yeah. that, hey, not only am I being honest, but I'm being incredibly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And being able to 
provide that in a context that is structured and formal, and this is the expectation for you, yeah. I think is uh, something very, very beautiful that you're doing. Yeah. And supported too. Yeah, and supported, yeah. yeah. You're so supported here and you're safe. Yeah, mm -hmm. you feel like, oh, this is my crew. They got my back. Mm -hmm. And that's how it feels. And that's why that's why it's great. I mean, even when I'm doing the workshops, sometimes stuff for me that hasn't come out yet will, will come out, right? Mm -hmm. And they get to see that I'm a part of this process just as much as as much as they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I want to kind of circle back a little bit too and say you kind of talked about this. You minimize and you sanitize. Yeah. And it's almost like there's this period of denial for people where they're just like, oh, that didn't really happen. Or what, what, what do you think it is that people kind of go to that place instinctually? And why does it take so long to come out of it? Like, what is your take on that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the way that we've been conditioned, especially mm -hmm. as, as men in our society, right? Mm -hmm. One, you're not supposed to be vulnerable. Two, men cannot be victims. Right. And so if you're a victim, it's like, uh oh, we're checking off to our radio the marks. What does that say about me and my masculinity? What does that say about me and my identity? How does it fit? Well, well I'm not looking like John Wayne or Superman. Now, what's going on here? Yeah. Right. Because <laughs> we have all these different archetypes and things that have been put up on pinnacles and pedestals that we're supposed to admire. Mm -hmm. So then saying that being a man looks a certain way right but so then it's scary to come out and say well i don't fit that definition i don't fit that formal i don't look like that in the mirror and so um, when you're in that environment it's scary it's it's fear to come out and to actually say something so if i minimize my story and if i sanitize my story it saves my identity a little bit more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and yeah, especially when you're a, a you know a young child, uh, but you're telling your story as an adult. You're you're thinking, okay, so as an adult, I should have been able to prevent it. I should have been able to stop it. I'm a I'm a like for me, I'm a six foot four, over two hundred pound, well over. Uh, not, <laughs> we can't tell. I should, I should have been able to stop this. And actually, when I first told my story, that's the reaction I got, even from my wife, because she didn't understand childhood sexual abuse. But I wanted to 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 explore this a bit because um, there's a there's a huge toll that that comes on us, not only for our being able to tell our story, but being able to identify that we were only nine or only eight or only seven when when this happened, and uh, but but our adult brain doesn't quite go there, right? It's like so so there are, you know, you were you talked about specific to men and the, and their denial. How do we uh, how do we react when we keep our stories and, and keep that that shame and that guilt internalized uh what are the effects that that you've seen in your studies for um especially men who are abused as children of their adult yeah this is this is where a lot and, and it's so it's it's interesting even when we think about this right because so when you think about an adult and they experience a traumatic event right and so they go through what's known as post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So from a DSMV, which is the Diagnostic Conservative Manual, usually that lasts for a certain amount of time and it's acute. So now, but think about the child who's experienced this traumatic event. They haven't developed in all the stages yet. So mentally, emotionally, physically, these different type of places. They don't have words to say what happened to them. They just have the emotions. And so then just think of them being stuck at that level and then still growing, at least physically, but you're stuck at that developmental state, right? Mm -hmm. And so then as you get older, you're like, okay, so why is it that I see the world in black and white all the time? Like, oh, no male friends. No, you know, why? Well, because at that stage, it was a male who abused me. Mm -hmm. I'm still stuck at that developmental state where things are black and white. I grow up, but my mental state is still there, right? So I'm still at this day where all guys are off. You're, no, 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 no. I don't, we don't, mm -hmm. right? We don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't talk to him. I don't, I don't, whatever, because in my mind, that represents a threat. That's fear because I'm still stuck in that one. Or, there's no gray. Right? It's, it's the whole black and white. And so what happens, though, is that because we've been 
I'm going to say, stuck for such a, a long time. We're still growing in other areas. Now this is where the complex post-traumatic stress disorder comes into play. So you still got these things here, but you're in this adult body, right? You have been using all these different type of defensive coping mechanisms in order to survive. They've been dysfunctional, but they have helped you to survive. Now you get to the point, let's say whatever, you go to therapy and stuff and you're working on the abuse, but guess what? All those dysfunctional things are still with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you're not working on those things, right? And so you come out from therapy, oh, I've, I've been discharged, whatever, I worked with abuse. So you're like, oh, but I can't hug my kids. Mm -hmm. I can't touch my kids. What's, what's going on, right? Well, I still have the CPTSD that's, that's there, right? And so that's what makes this very challenging. And that's why when people say, well, aren't you over that yet? Hmm. It's like, well, if you only could understand how this works, then you probably wouldn't ask me that question. And I feel if anyone who asks that question, they are not your people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I really, there's certain responses that I feel if anyone responds that way, I'm done. Mm -hmm. because you don't you don't have any empathy mm -hmm. or understanding you have a lack of understanding or don't want to understand because why aren't you over that yet like but uh, you'll get it you know you're, you're strong you'll get over it like, yeah. but no just listen sometimes yeah. like I don't even need a response from you mm -hmm. yeah ever you know um but I just feel like when you get those type of responses, just know those aren't your people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and sometimes it's it's dull, but sometimes it's training people with the expectations. Like sometimes I'll say to people, look, I'm going to share something with you. I don't need any advice. I don't mm -hmm. I just need you to listen. And I say, be with me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? And if they say no, then I move on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you for making that easy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's find out, you know, what I need because maybe they're not the right person and maybe they can't handle this information, right? been burned so many times by people who, who couldn't handle the information and write and then like uh they're like okay you need to go get help something's wrong with you well thank you i know that right <laughs> reinforcing my negative yeah, thoughts yeah, yeah exactly but what if that person is someone that you have to be with like your parent or your brother or sister or your spouse or your child and you can't say they're not my people go away <laughs> how do you how do you how do you work with that I build my family consciously mm. because there are people out there that can actually handle. So, so let's just say for me, like, so your abuse and stuff does happen or some of it happens like within your family and stuff and you've got people that are denying it, okay? They can't help me, right? So then what I've done is, and I always teach the guys when I'm working, you've got to create your circle, right? This is something, you know, kind of I say, Where's your circle of 12? Mm -hmm. You guys probably get the, the idea of where's your circle of 12. And I said, the reason you want, and most guys, we're going to have maybe two or three, but I encourage you to get 12, is because when you have your circle of 12, if you have each one that represents a different part, then you don't burn out one individual, mm -hmm. right? So I've got my hugger people. When I need a hug, I can go get a hug from them, and it's not going to be any problem whatsoever. I've got my logic people. When I'm just going off, whatever, maybe too emotional stuff, and I need someone to grind me, they bring me back around with the logic, right? And so you got to have your different people. You need to have people that are empathetic. You need to have people that will pull you out of the pity party. So that's the whole purpose of building community because that's how it's supposed to be. We're mm -hmm. building so that you're helping each other and you're not burning out one person. So even if that community isn't your spouse, you're saying build the community. Yes. Don't burn your spouse out with all the information. Yeah, no, that's the first thing I tell, I tell my clients. I'm like, your spouse, your significant other, your loved one is not your therapist. Mm -hmm. So don't take them there, <laughs> right? They can be for moments, but not for the entire duration of all the No, time. they're there to support you, Okay, right? Yeah. Not to be your therapist. Mm -hmm. They're there to support you so they can listen to you, right? They can care for you. They can have the empathy for you. Can even make suggestions, but they are not your therapist, right? And so that's why you need to have these people in here so then they can just take care of the way that they can function, mm -hmm. right? 
without it affecting your whole, because just think about, okay, so you've got your significant other, your spouse, and you're your therapist. Okay, so when does it come on? When does it go off? When does it, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so you don't want to bring that, your kids, right? Now you got parent to five kids that are running around. <laughs> so no, right? And so that's why one of the reasons it's difficult for us because we're not building that tribe. And so when you're in isolation, I always tell the, uh, the guys I work with, healing comes in community, not mm. isolation, right? And so you have to be willing to, and that's one of the reasons that I do the workshops, because then guys start finding those pieces of that mm -hmm. with the other people say, hey, can we keep in contact? Yeah. You know, some some of them, their families become friends and they start doing stuff, whatever, to, you know. So some yeah. of my community is in this room. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You yeah. know, like, that's exactly why I started Voice to be honest, so to have a come, come unity. Right. You know, and to have a community of people that hear you, see you, believe you, support you. And, you know, like, even at the, at our retreat. Yeah. Phase two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, now the co-directors co of men of VBA and they've become close friends. Yeah. And like, you know, even when we do our support groups as well, like girls are starting business together. Yes. You know, they're friends and they're calling each other and they've already created that community of yes. 12, you know, that you yeah. say. And it's so important to have that because you know it could be your mom your spouse because my mom was i felt like was my therapist yes. after my assault for a long mm -hmm. time you know and but she was okay with that yeah because she was she definitely was support yeah she right. put me in my place checked me when mm -hmm. i was wrong and you know like when i'm like oh i'm okay i'm okay she's like brianna sit down yes <laughs> <laughs> you're not okay yeah you are not okay and yeah. it's okay to not be yeah. okay yeah but what are you going to do and who do you need to speak with to right. make sure that you move past this this you having to disguise you being right not okay yeah. you know and that's having that support or therapy or yeah. you know things like that yeah. i think that's so important i think a lot of people you know can fall into this very it's a it's a good notion that like oh if i'm in therapy i'm good that's all right. i need to do. like i just share everything with my therapist and i'm okay but i love that you're bringing this back because it's like your healing does come into your community and when you rise and when you heal and when you grow into the person that your community can always know that you could be, it brings yeah. them up as well. Yes. It encourages them that like, look at this person who like through all this pain, through all this difficulty has transformed that narrative mm -hmm. and made it something beautiful. Like kind of what we were talking about yesterday yeah. with your nickname, right? You were like, yes. this nickname that you gave right. me, yes. you of me, t bone I'm going to take that and it's going to be a sign of my strength. Yeah. And that transformation of narrative is like that's so beautiful that's so beautiful yeah and i would love for you to share a bit of why they call you t-bomb yeah and yeah let's dig into this yes. <laughs> why they call um, you t-bomb why they call all right you yeah. so like as i said i'm the king of trauma <laughs> 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 but i'm smiling the yeah. smiling's a thriver so okay so uh t-bone or coach t-bone so that comes from i was living in seattle um during that time i think i was working for amazon if you know anything about seattle it's like it is is now here in December. It's, it's rainy. It's oh, wet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It gets dark pretty quickly, right? And so I'm on my way to, to work doing, you know, the carbon footprint thing of catching the bus to, to work. And so as I'm walking across the street, the young neighbor girl down the street, she had just got a driver's license, right? So she comes down the street and she turns the corner as I'm walking across the street in her pickup truck. And she hits me at 35 mile an hour. Okay. Now, I think I went kind of, I went under the truck, on top of the truck, through the air, and I'm knocked out. So I'm flying, right? So the report says I flew 70 feet. So as I was coming down from the other direction, another car comes the other direction. Damn, and hit me. So when I wake up, I'm on a stretcher, you know, or whizzing, whatever, to, to the hospital. They get me in there and uh, MRIs, you know, and they're making all these comments. Yes, doctors are so funny. Oh, look at that. Look at this. <laughs> Tell uh, me. Yeah, it. I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, his muscle's been separated from his bone. He's got TPI, whatever, traumatic brain stuff. And they're like, but he doesn't have a single broken bone after being hit twice like that. But like, no one survives. No one survives that. So it's like, okay. Uh, so, you know, when I come out, whatever, a month later, whatever, I, you know, I can't walk, I'm in a, in a wheelchair because I have to retrain, you know, the muscles and those, those different types of things. 
But then I lost my superpower, which helped me in the corporate world, right? And so that was that partial photographic memory, right? So I could come here, talk to you guys, whatever, and stuff. Come back two, three years later, and I tell you exactly where you were sitting, what you had on, and you said, mm. and what you said, right? Works for any corporate. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so um, I tried to go back to work, and I was sitting in the meeting with the vice president at Amazon. And I came out the meeting and I couldn't remember a single thing that we had said. Something, something's wrong. So um, I was like, okay, I need, I need to, I need to figure this out because I was still having issues. I couldn't cross the street because of the post-traumatic stress disorder, right? And that was the classic case, three to six months acute issue. So that one, I'm like, okay, yeah, so that's what that one was. So I'm like, okay, so I'm going to go work on my psychology degree. I'm the type of person like, I got to know why. So I'll go like, it's been three years ago. You know, okay. But that was me, right? Because I got to know. I got to know what, why it works. And so we're sitting there in the class and I'm sharing, I'm sharing my story. And as I share my story, when you share anything traumatic like that, people just kind of go silent because it's hard for them to, to process or they laugh or, or they giggle because that's just the mechanism that happens. And so someone did and they're like, oh, oh, they're like, you know, you, you weren't in a car, but you were T-boned, right? And I said, you know what? I said, you know, I'm going to embrace that. And I said, I'm going to embrace it because now I've got this short-term memory stuff so that every time I hear that name T-boned, it reminds me that I have a purpose because according to the doctors, I'm not supposed to be here. Okay. So every time I, now my mom won't call me T-Bow. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I did a few times. But, yeah, um, but yeah, that's, and so it, it just constantly reminds me. I love that. Yeah. Purposeful. Yeah, purposeful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you talked, your website is amazing. And I, mm -hmm. I found you, from listening to your podcast, mm -hmm. I, I love the calming feeling of your voice or, you the know, hypnotherapy it's just, voice. <laughs> I guess, I guess is, and I want to talk about hypnotherapy in a minute, but um, you talk about uh, you, on your website, you have different stages that people are in and you and you you ask them to mm -hmm. fill out, look at look at. There's like a, a list of a hundred things <laughs> like, okay, how many you could, you should have like a checkbox and see how many that you actually fall under. But um, can you explain the, the three liberating mindsets for survivors or the stages that you work with? People? Man, there's just so many. Okay, so, um, so, okay. So here's a, so let me just break this up first of all. So there's three phases when I'm coaching and I'm working with individuals, right? So Let's just say if I was going to work with you in, in phase one, phase one is pretty much, I'm going to say, the acknowledging and defining phase. So what happens if, if someone wants to work with me, I kind of do an interview because I need to figure out if you're still in an acute post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Because there are some people that they're still reeling, right? And so they've got a lot of those acute things. They're having like, you know, flashbacks, constant flashbacks. You know, they feel almost like they're paranoid, whatever. So that means something is triggering them to the point where they're dysfunctioning, right? At that point, then I'm referring them to the therapist, the psychiatrist, whatever, right? Because I can't really help them with the coaching, you know, at that at that point. But if they're beyond that and they're just dealing with the the we're going to say the CPT or they're not aware, then that's where we start with the acknowledge piece. And so, like the first piece would be, um, you know, was I abused, right? Because that's where this whole denial stuff whatever comes in into the situation so then we have you know different exercises and things for memory recall and okay and then once we determine okay i was sexually abused and i can acknowledge that but now we have to define it. you're like well what do you mean by define okay so you go to some survivors and they say you were raped and they're like don't use that word mm -hmm. Right, because then for them that represents something. They're like, well, that's kind of feminine power. And you're saying that, okay. Then you go to somebody else and say, well, I was molested. And I'm like, no, it was way more than that. Don't you dare use that word. So each person is defining for them 
the abuse, right? Now, I always encourage people to keep your definitions fluid because you'll notice as you're working through the different things, sometimes you're going to say, yep, I felt like I was molested. Sometimes I was violated. Sometimes right? so I was raped, whatever. If you keep it open and fluid, then it allows whatever your definition to grow with you as you grow. Okay. So that's, that's the first phase. So acknowledge and define and then disclose. So that's all within, the, let's say, the, the, first, the first phase. Okay. The second phase is now what's known as M. I call this the Adam, as you can see, right? Acknowledge, define, mm -hmm. disclose. So yeah. that's section one. So that's the add. Okay. Now we get to the M, and the first M is going to be manage. So this is for the person who's coming in. Maybe they've already had some therapy and stuff, but now they're dealing with a complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So they're like, hey, look, you know, I've had so many years of, of therapy, but I still can't figure out why I'm having an issue, whatever, with my spouse, why, you know, my kids, I can't, whatever. So that's the complex post-traumatic stress that we're working. So now we're going to manage it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So what are, let's just say three areas. Let's say we've got six months. What are the three areas that you want to work on from your complex post-traumatic stress disorder? What's your healing vision for this? Okay. So hopefully when we're done working, this is how I want to be. I want to be able to, to speak to my spouse, or I want to be able to have, you know, um, intimacy, sex, whatever with my spouse without it just feeling like I'm just there right? Kind of like the sexual abuse dissociation, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, oh, okay. So we can, we can work with that. Then when we get to, well, those that do, we get to the last stage, which is manifestation. And so this part is, I call it transformation. So this is the person who comes in and they're like, yo T, we just need to go from phase one, two, and three, because I need to transform my whole life. And these are people that usually when they come in, they are transformed to the point like they want to build a business or, or something like that. So we're going to transform your life so you can actually build whatever it is that you want to do. So I had one uh, individual that came through, Raj. I think he's on the website, but, but Raj. And so that was Raj. And Raj came in. So it, it took us 18 months, right? 18 months. And I'm like, okay, so what do you want to manifest? And it's interesting when we think about survivors because... Uh, some of the complex post-traumatic stress, stress things that we have, we don't really notice. We think that they're just part of us. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just indecisive. Mm -hmm. No, it's not just <laughs> indecisive. Where's that indecisiveness? Whatever. What's you know? underneath that? Yeah, right. but exactly. What's under? What's underneath that? And it's like, I had one, <laughs> had one guy at Scotty. I love Scotty. <laughs> and so Scotty, uh, he would actually take me on his job interviews with him, mm -hmm. right? And so. He would just like, oh, this is this is a T. He's my coach. He's just going to be sitting in the background. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> whatever, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm just watching his actions and stuff like that. And he doesn't even notice, right? He's just whatever in the zone and the interview would come out. I'm like, dude, you're really hostile to women. Do you notice? He's like, I don't even notice. Wow. I don't even notice that, right? And so then we had to go into, it's like, okay, where's... Where is that stemming that, from? Yes, where is mm -hmm. that stemming from that that you that and that you're treating women like this? And it's like, you know, so we were able to you know, actually work through work through that, right? But that's transformation. So that's the person's like, okay, I'm in phase one, two, three. Even if I feel like I've done it before, I'm gonna go through it so I can so I can trans transform. Be the person that I want. To yes, be. that I want to the, be. The two right. I know. I always. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you love if you go up to the website and you click on the results. He's one of the guys that's speaking, and you can just see him just beaming. He's like, yeah. He's like, you know, I was into drug abuse and promiscuity, and he's like, and all these different type of things. He's like, he's like, but I feel like a kid again. He said, I'm finally finding out. Who I am and who I want to be, I and you can just that. see him just yeah. just light up. That right? inner child, yes. is happy and proud of yes. him. Yes, you yeah. know I love that you just spoke about when you're on your healing journey or disassociating from the sexual violence that you've experienced some of the negative things that you get into to uh, cover it up, cover up the pain mm -hmm. or the shame. 
and all the things like the alcohol, mm -hmm. the sex, the thing yeah. that you're taking your power back, yeah. you know, by having sex with all these people or completely not having sex at all. Yeah. You know, or also like, OK, well, let me try if I was sexually assaulted by a man. Let me try a woman. Maybe yeah. I won't have the same experience. Right. So you're completely like separating yourself from the experience versus facing the experience. So yeah. I love that you just spoke about that. And if you could share with us some of the things that people specifically meant that you that you know that you work with, what are some of the I don't know the terminology. We we'll usually explain what we call we call it reaction formation. Okay. And so reaction formation is where I'm pretty much doing the total opposite to kind of say that I'm okay. So I'll run into guys and let's so like Scotty's like, well, so why am I promiscuous, right? That's that's not me. Well, I'm just trying, I'm going the total opposite to prove to other people that I am masculine, that I'm okay. So I go around, I sleep with anything that moves, mm -hmm. right? That's what we mean by reaction formation, right? Mm -hmm. So you're doing the total opposite, you know, to kind of say that you're okay. That you're pretty much that you're that you're, you're okay, right? Um, and there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that for male survivors, um, and it's because oftentimes, like as as Lord said, being vulnerable, not being able to be in a place where I can actually be be vulnerable and say, you know what, I'm kind of you know questioning my sexual identity right now, and have a space for that, right. and be okay with that. So, you know, right now. I'm just asexual, mm. right? And so for me, I had a, a period where I had hypnophobia, right? And so hypnophobia, the fear of being touched. And I can remember even when it was triggered, I was sitting in a meeting at Microsoft, right? Mm. And so we're just sitting there and just innocently, this lady, her hand drops and it brushes my, and it just triggers me like crazy, wow. right? And so I get to the point where I just cannot be, Touched, 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 right, at, at all, right? And uh, I mean, I can even remember myself. It, it would trigger me back to the time when I was abused and I was hiding under the bed in a fetal position so that no one would touch me, right? So that's what was that was going on for me. That's what was kind of coming, coming back for me. And so once again, you know, I'm Mr. Gung Ho, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I got to figure this out because who doesn't want to be touched, mm -hmm. right? You did. And so, yeah, uh -huh. I know we all, yeah, <laughs> we, all, we all do. But sometimes that's a hard thing when things are triggered for us. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to nix this. So I decided to go to massage therapy school. Oh my God. I love that you do. <laughs> you go for it. Exposure like, therapy. Like, yeah. it's the thing you don't want to do. Right. That's the way to do it. And I don't, you know, recommend that for everyone, but that was just, <laughs> that was just me. Yeah. And, you know, and I could just see myself as people are working out, me, you know, switching and, right. and doing all these different type of things. But in my mind, you know, I'm starting to process and, and work things that, okay, it's okay. This is safe touch, whatever mm -hmm. those different type of things. And so then I, and that was, that was a year and a half program. Wow. Because it was intense. It was almost like, because um, you had to do all the kinesiology, muscle insertion points, all those different. So you had to know it was a, it was a pretty vulnerable school. So I come out and um, actually I'm in clinical. So I'm doing my clinical. So part of their program was you would do clinical in different areas, sometimes the hospital, right? Uh, so you would get some of your experience there. And so I was working on this one guy and I'm doing whatever my, there's just, you know, it's just intuition. There's just this vibe, right? And in my mind, I'm like, for some reason, I'm like, I just got to give this, this guy the best loving care massage that I can. So that's what I'm doing, doing my effleurage and strokes and those different types <laughs> of things and moving back and forth. And then once I finish, he starts crying, right? God, is it that bad? <laughs> 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 so he says, he says, no, no, he says, this is what I want you to, he says, crying, because this was the first time that I've been able to get a massage from a male figure because I was sexy abused and I felt safe. Mm -hmm. He's like, there was just something about the way that you, and I said, well, I'm a survivor. Wow. Right. So. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic for people just to be able to find those ways in which they want to heal. Yeah. We wanted to ask you about what are your most successful steps and strategies for survivors looking for healing? Okay. So um, I dropped the superlatives. 
right? Mm -hmm. And the reason I do, because each individual is different. I would say on, on this path, and we kind of already talked, we talked about it, so first thing you have to acknowledge, but there has to be, I'm going to say, there's a book like, I think it's called Whatever It Takes. Mm -hmm. That's the mentality that a survivor has to have. Mm -hmm. And because oftentimes you're demotivated. This is the analogy that, I'm, that I use with my clients. I'm like, this sucks. You know why this sucks? Okay, so I give the analogy of two houses. You're next to this house. They take their garbage and they throw their garbage in your yard. Okay? Now, it's not right what they did, that they threw the garbage in your yard, but the only way that your yard is going to get clean is if you clean the garbage out. Mm -hmm. And it sucks because you're not the one who put it there. But in order for your yard and your yard to look the way that it has to, you have to do the work of getting the garbage out that someone else has put in your life, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say that's kind of the, the, that's the number one, I'm going to say, mindset that you have to have being willing to do whatever it takes. The next thing is you got to make sure that you find competent help. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, competent. Competent yeah. help, right? Mm -hmm. And so you want to find individuals, you know, at least whether it be a therapist, a counselor, coach, whatever, that they've had at least some type of experience with what's going on. And then also that they've had an opportunity, if they are a survivor also, to work through some of the issues as well, right? I can tell you sometimes when working <clears throat> with guys, right, you have to be able to hear the stories. You have to be able to listen to the story. You have to be able to hold the space, right? So you have to be great at active listening. Man, some of those stories are really hard to hear, right? And so, but you have to be in a place where you can like hold the space, whatever for that person for that without projecting yourself for <laughs> into, you know, in, into their stuff. Um, but then at the same time to be there to be that support. So make sure that you find competent help. <clears throat> the next thing is uh, this. You have to, as much as possible, it's gonna come up. You have to avoid trying to find an answer to the question, why? Why? You know, was it, you know, just like we, she's talking about being 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 raped. Well, was it the clothes that I wear? Was there something about me? I would say, did I have the mark of Cain mm -hmm. on my head where everyone could see, oh, you're the one that should, we should abuse. That was like me. I was like, wait a minute, especially the abuse that happened within my family. I'm like, why didn't I get the memo? Mm -hmm. Everyone else seems seems to know that I'm the one that gets gets used. I didn't get the memo, right? And so then I'm thinking, well, my goodness, what does that say about about me? Is there some vibe or something that that I'm giving that I'm that I'm attracting this? And the why question, you can never answer. Mm -hmm. You just you you can't even if you have the person there in front of you and you ask them why. They still can't even give you the full answer yeah. of the why, whatever, what was going on at that time. So that's one of the, I'm going to say those are the top three things when we're talking about even just starting, you know, your healing there. I run into so many guys that get so caught up in, in the why that it just becomes destructive, yeah. right? And so I try and move them, you know, to a, a, a different, if you want to call it open-ended question, <laughs> as opposed to to the why, because the why just, it doesn't get you where you need to go. Right? You can never answer yeah. for a predator, yeah. you know, and just like you were saying, mentioning it earlier, Craig, about feeling like a victim, continuously being victimized. Well, like I had the Mark of Cain, mm -hmm. as we were talking about, and, and you do ask why, because you start to think, okay, what am I giving off that... And, and I would go years, and then somebody would would uh, attempt it or do it or something, and I'd be like, "Why, you know, why is this continuing to happen to me throughout my life? Do I have this mark of Cain? You, you say on your, so you do ask why because and then, I, honestly, for me, the minute 
minute I actually stopped burying my abuse and started dealing with it, that's when it stopped happening. Yeah, mm. that's because you're still looking through the shame filter when you're asking the why, right? Because you're saying, what is it about me that caused as opposed to, no, that you're looking at it through, I say the, the shame filter. So the shame filter should be coming on the person that perpetrated mm -hmm. you, but you're kind of say self-projecting it onto yourself, right? And so now you're holding the shame that the other person should actually be dealing, mm -hmm. dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I said you'll never you'll never get an answer to, to the why question until you get to the point where you can break that. And as you start breaking the pieces of what I call the sh shame filter, so just think of it as glasses or filters. These are the shame filters. And so everything that you look through until you're working through the views is through shame filters, through shame, through shame glasses. As you start to clear that up, then you're not looking through it as, as much the shame filter, mm -hmm. right? You're looking at, no, I'm a person. Right, I was sexually abused. People, we all have jerk sides, we have good sides, right? Mm -hmm. So that person, when they encountered me, whatever, the jerk side of mojo mm -hmm. or whatever was going on, no excuse for it. But still, that's what was that was them. Right. And I love how you just mentioned once you acknowledge, but you talked about mm -hmm. how important acknowledging is. Mm -hmm. And I always say it's, it's so important because then you're just like, okay, it did happen. Now yeah. what? But now, once you acknowledge it, and it stopped happening. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so maybe I just stopped feeling like it was going to happen, and so it didn't happen because I thought I was giving up. Maybe I was giving up something that that fear or something. But it, uh, yeah. I mean, I started feeling safe. Yeah. Right. And and when that. so acknowledging my story made me feel safer in public. Mm -hmm. Before that, I'd be walking in a in an airport and thinking everybody wanted to attack me, any male, anyway, wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the statistics, oh, sorry. You don't know, the, the statistics show, like, like, even if you've been sexually assaulted as a child, the chances of you being sexually assaulted as an adult is, yeah. is high. It's higher. And I would say that when I was raped, I'm like, did he, what did he see in me that I was a target, you mm -hmm. know, because it, I think about when I was sexually assaulted as a as a child. I'm like, he must have seen something in my eyes or the vulnerability. And sometimes I do think predators see they see the emptiness. They see something in the non healing, acknowledged person. Yeah, they even have profiles. So pedophiles actually have profiles of certain things that they're looking for. Like so, like for for boys and things, they'll look for boys that have like a single parent or parent divorce because they're going to be more vulnerable, right? Because now you don't you don't have maybe one to actually share with. That they're busy, they're working all the time, so they don't have time. Mm -hmm. um, they look for individuals that need attention. So if there's emotional neglect, right? And this is hard because for a lot of us as survivors, this is where the abuse becomes difficult because the abuse, it wasn't violent, it was grooming, right? And so in the grooming, what they're doing is they're preparing you. And you you talk to some perpetrators, they'll take a whole year or so just to groom a person to get them to that point where they can actually assault and abuse them. So now for that survivor, you're like, oh no, what's what's going on? No, but Oh, it was consensual. Why are you thinking yeah. that it was because you've been groomed to think that it was it, that it was consensual, right? And so now you've got this whole other issue. You are like, well, no, you know, I wanted it, or or okay, let's talk about the physiology, right? And so I'm being abused, right? And I ejaculate. Why I have an orgasm? Oh, okay. So did I like it? Did I did I not like it? Right? Yeah. And so now it's like, okay, now I am totally confused. So now imagine that, and this is how I try to explain it to, to, to my clients. So I said, whatever, what age you are, seven or eight, I said, so now imagine that part of your brain being lit and open. And let's just say it probably shouldn't be open at least till your late teens or you know early 20s. What do you do with that? And then they just look at me and they start getting it and, and understanding, wow, that is a lot for a child to try and take in and, and understand, you know, at that, at that point. And there's just so much stuff that's going on. So I was, I was hanging with this uh, 
this one neuro. Well, she was she was a neuroforensic whatever. And so I was asked, I was asking her, you know, how does how does this work? And she was explaining to me, um, she's like, okay, she's like, in your brain, she says the jump from pleasure to pain is only like a nano, mm. whatever. Right. And so she says, what happens is you could be abused, and during the abuse, there's pain, there's hurt, but it's so close to that place, it can jump right over to the other side and be pleasurable, right? Yeah. Like, oh my goodness. I'm like, okay, so, okay, so she's like, so think about now that being wired into you. Now you're growing up, you've got CPTSD, right? And you're trying to wonder why during your intimacy, you're kind of violent or you're going for these extreme whatever reactions, right? And she goes, well, oftentimes what happens has jumped over to the other side. And now that's recorded there. It's a new pathway that's starting to be formed. Yes, it's a known neural path. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about the perpetrators because you, you bring up a really good point about how they, they find you. And, they, and, and this has happened in our society and uh, the the Boy Scouts, the the Catholic Church, or any church, I I'm I, I was raised Catholic, and Catholic Church is now doing this uh, virtues training, which I do as part of that, and um, it. It, it takes away that um, one place. And I think that I feel like we have to take away the places where these, these perpetrators can prey on, on young children more easily. And they always find the next one. They always try to find the next one. But the more we can shut these down. You mentioned uh, in one of your podcasts that I listened to that silence is the, is the, the greatest uh, enabler of perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, how do you think we stop the sense? Is it is it our silence uh, as, as as victims until we become survivors? Or um, okay, so I'm going to say at least when, when we're talking about when we're dealing with like the the perpetrators. Okay, silence is a piece, right? Um, but then yet at the same time, we do have to fo we have to focus on the perpetrator. I mean, there's yes. there's stuff that's it's actually going on whatever with that individual or you know or, or with that person that they're in that that spot whatever that that mental spot and that's why when we talk about you know sexual abuse it's really about control right in most cases it's it's about control so it's like what is going on for that individual that they feel that they need to control i remember i had one client i was working with he was one of my youngest ones and he was 19 years old and he had he had been um, he had been molested and raped with her by his grandfather, and so as we're there in, in in the workshop, and he's like he's like he's like I'm just so dumbfounded. He's like I don't get this. He's like, you know, Grandpa had his wife, whatever. So if he wanted sex, he could get sex any time that he wanted to, whatever from her. So why did he need me, right? Why did he he need me? And as he started reflecting on it a little more, kind of the situation that was going on, he realized. It was about control, right? He was the idol that his grandfather could actually control, right? Whatever that, that that meant to him. So, you know, so it's like the the, the whole the, the whole perpetrator. One, yeah, we can do things we to prevent, but I don't know. It's it's a hard one, you know. It's like okay, so you know, whatever the priest and stuff were. Well, you know, do you give them some type of mental psychiatric whatever before they enter, whatever to kind of see what's coming up for them? Or well, in, in Virtus, it's it's more about training everybody to be aware of of not letting children ever be alone with mm -hmm. without two adults present mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And it's a uh, more of that's the direction that, that they're working on and. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's um, you know hopefully that stays with it because the you know this has happened since the dawn of time. Yeah, but, uh, I, but I think it's also it's it's even more powerful if you can teach the children to have autonomy over their bodies, right? Mm -hmm. Because see, what happens is 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 this is that okay? So whatever you have loving whatever parents, relatives, and stuff around, right? And so, does everyone now become a suspect? 
But if you train your child to have autonomy over their over their bodies, like, hey, grandpa, thanks, but please don't hug me there or touch me there. Mm. Right. And then if you're, you know, because I have one person I was working with, and he's trying to figure out how we're going to do this. And I'm like, okay, so this is what you need to touch your kids. Cause you still want to be able to go to Thanksgiving and stuff, whatever, with right. the people and stuff like that. I was like, okay. And so, but you let every know. This is what we're teaching. And he says, hey, you know, I'm a survivor. So this is the reason I'm teaching my kids this. So don't get offended right. if they say to you, I don't want to hug right now. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. We're just teaching them to have to have autonomy, whatever, you know, of their of their bodies, right? And to me, that's the, the that's the best way to do it, or I would say the best, mm-hmm. but I think it'd be a, a very uh, advantage way to, to do it. I think so too. Like I think with the kids. Unfortunately, our parents or some parents are just not don't know how to communicate mm-hmm. like sex at such a young age. But it's I always say when I have a child, I'm so nervous mm-hmm. because I'm gonna think everyone is a right because of what I've experienced. Right. And so my whole thing is don't it's not touch you here, 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 oh no, dear. Yeah. You know, yeah. like those are the you know, in it no one can touch you there. Yeah. You know, and if someone, like you said, if someone, they don't want to hug, like, yeah. for example, I went with my boyfriend to his family's in New York mm-hmm. and his um, cousin's daughter, she's probably about 11 or 12. And I went to give her a hug and she said, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when she said that, I was like, you are a smart girl, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I said, and continue to be mm-hmm. that way. Yeah, you know, with anybody you don't feel comfortable with, I'm a stranger. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. like why are you hugging me, girl? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she said no, thank you, and she crossed her arms and she looked me dead in the eye mm-hmm. and meant what she said. And I was like, I love that you have control of your body. Mm-hmm. You know, so the autonomy of the body and teaching children that just because people want to touch you because right. they're adults right. does not mean that they can touch you. You, you know. know? Right. I wish that training would have been out when my kids were little, because what I, uh, and I wasn't even, you know, I didn't even accept my abuse, but what, what I did and just inherently probably, I mean, I'm sure because of my abuse, I made sure that they were never anywhere without me. And so it almost killed me. I had four kids. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you had to be everywhere I, at once. I had to be assistant coach, at <laughs> least on every sporting event. I had to go to every, uh, you know, every, uh, sleepover mm-hmm. thing for school. I had to be a chaperone mm-hmm. at every single thing because I wanted to watch them like hawks. And um, That's good, though. Yeah, but it would have been a lot easier <laughs> <laughs> just to train them, you know, to be aware. Mm-hmm. Right, but you didn't know any better. I you know what I, I mean? And you better. did the best that you could yeah. with what you yeah. had. Yeah. And I'm sure that they are still very proud of the man that you were and being right. present, you know, because you were very present. Oh, yeah. uh, that's what was so when I'm coaching guys like that, and so they have a problem letting their kids, like I said, but you can't smother them, right? Mm-hmm. So they won't be able to grow. So I just said, okay, so this is what we'll do. I said, you and your wife think about this. So instead of the sleepovers being somewhere else, you guys host the sleepovers. Mm-hmm. Right. And so then that way, you know. Well, we did host the sleepovers, but I ended up like sitting in the stairs half the whole night. They were all asleep, making sure that everything was cool. Yeah. But that is okay. Yeah. But that's the survivor mentality. Yeah. You know, like I always said for a while, I didn't want kids, especially a daughter, because I was like, if someone does anything to her, I'm sorry, I'm going to smiling in a mud shot. Happy, you know? But now that I, ha- I feel safe, I'm in a safe, healthy relationship. I'm like, okay, I do that. Yeah. Like, I think that I can actually control, not control, because I want her to live her own life, but I can have, like, teach her mm-hmm. to yeah. love on herself and be the autonomy of her own body. Yeah. And that is so important. Teach her taekwondo you. at a very mm-hmm. low level. Yeah, <laughs> boxing too. <laughs> but that's the thing about survivors. We're seeking the one thing that we so that's why I'm always trying to get control of the situation. Whatever it was like before, I think you get back something that you did. You didn't have someone else was controlling us. And so then we try and control our environment, whatever OCD and those different types of things, because it's like, okay, now I have whatever this power to control at least these things that we do. Some people they go to the extreme with it, right? right? And then it really becomes dysfunctional. 
you know, and then for for some people, they figure out exactly, you know, how to manage it. Mm -hmm. But that's really important. I had, unfortunately, I had one person that uh, I was coaching and he was like that. And I said, but look, I'm like, you can't be with your daughter every single day. What are you going to do? You can't be with her every moment when she's at school. Mm -hmm. And um, what are you going to do? And so, unfortunately, his daughter had been abused mm -hmm. at school. But because we had talked about that, he realized, well, I couldn't be there. But then since he was a survivor, he was able to help her work through wow. the issues and things that was going on. He would start understanding and seeing certain behavior. Oh, she's not hanging with her friends. She's mm -hmm. isolating herself, this type of behavior. And I just asked him, I said, do you think there's possibly any, you know, sexual abuse, whatever that taking place? He's like, I don't, I don't know. I said, well, just be open and give her time. And she, eventually she she shared, right? And then they were able to get her help. Wow. Right. So is the father just knowing her daughter, understanding her, being with her through that process, is going to pick up on little things and say, yeah. oh, something's a little amiss. Something yeah. are just things to note. And with your guidance, it seems like it's able to merge a lot of those pieces together. Um, we've thrown this term around complex PTSD. Yeah. A little bit new, of a newer term. I think many of us have heard about post-traumatic stress disorder. Could you give us a little bit of a rundown on that? Yeah, so it's the same. It just has a C in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it wasn't, it wasn't an A. It wasn't an A. Okay. It was a C grade. Yeah. <laughs> Well, pretty much when you look at the DSMV, so they've defined, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, and it has certain criteria. It lasts a certain amount of time. They give it, like, up to a year, right? Okay, but, but then when they start noticing, them, but wait a minute, we've got people that are experiencing these same type of things, but the traumatic event happened way back here, right? So then what are we going to do with that? Oh, we don't know. That's complex. So, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. But here's the thing: no one acknowledges it, right? So, mm -hmm. if you were to go to the statistical um, manual that psychiatrists and psychologists, it's not in there. Yep everyone acknowledges that it exists, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons is because there's so many pieces to it that it's complex, it's harder to then like, okay, so if you have clinical depression, three to six months, whatever, bam, bam, check, 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 check. This one's totally off because everyone's different just mm -hmm. depending on how the trauma has affected them. And yeah. There's no standard definition because everyone is going through their own yeah. very human experience. Right. Oh, right. Very sometimes tragic life. Yes. Trying to categorize it with it lasts this long, it's right. like these things, it means you're getting too high right. sleep. It's like that's, that's right. Man. It's three years later, and you're still having flashbacks. Yeah. You right. Yeah. So yeah. that's still part of PD. <laughs> right. So that's what I do. And it's oh, mental health. Yeah. You know? It's so funny because I work with engineers and they're always throwing out these acronyms. And so I thought CPSD was going to be much more. Oh, yeah. Top like, <laughs> 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 it's, just, uh, oh, it's not the standard, so it's complex. It's hysterical. Oh. But now it makes so much sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what are your um, what are your most successful st uh, healing? Like you know, uh, you've helped how many men? In I don't know. I, I mean, you know, it's like that. <laughs> twenty three years. I mean, yeah. I wish I knew you twenty three years ago. <laughs> God, it would have saved me a lot of time. But yeah. Well, maybe <laughs> I was, you know. But each year you get more and more, right? So yeah. when you first met me, I wouldn't have had as much as that I do. So what are you, uh, what are like some of your most amazing? So Scotty, I love Scotty. You, I keep talking about Scotty, and if you listen to the podcast, you'll get to hear you'll get to hear him. Um, so when Scotty came came to me. And this is another thing off you know, about us as survivors. Sometimes we can be overachievers because that's one way that we medicate us. Right? Talk to me, do I have plan A through Z just in case? <laughs> so, but that was also a control thing that I realized. Uh, trust. But um, so Scotty, um, Scotty is great. When I when I met him, uh, he was this, this individual. He was he was an achiever, and that was because of the because of the sexual abuse. Okay, he was just have done things I'd never, you know, just thought about. Like, so we have this one thing sometimes when we're doing um, hypnotherapy sessions, I'll have them to, to, to look through their folders 
you know, just so we can like, okay, so what was going on during that time? So it just helps refresh their, their memory as we go into hypnotherapy. And I'm looking at his, his shoulder, it's like, do that. Yeah, that's Jim Caviezel. They were our neighbors. Mm. Look at when we started this stuff. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's Jack Nicholson. <laughs> you know, so just you just never know where where people are, whatever are coming from. Mm. But then one of the things that he realized as we got you know further you know into his story, that in his family they used money to say that we were okay, mm. right? And so he was you know affluent whatever. But that was the the mechanism that they were using to cover up and say, no, everything is okay, whatever the abuse, whatever had taken place, even though the, the father, whatever that was abusing, mm -hmm. was abusing the kids. So when I met him, I say, oh my goodness. Like I said in the video, he named all the stuff, whatever he was, so he was, he, he was a case. And so I worked with him two years, right? And so, um, we were just trying to even just get him out of the house, right? So he'd just go to his place and come back. And so I remember just start giving him little growth work assignments. I was like, hey, this is what I, this is what I'd like for you to do. So uh, when you get up in the morning, I just want you to put on your running shoes. Even if you don't go anywhere, come down, get your coffee, whatever, read your, that's fine. Next growth work assignment. I want you to put your running shorts on. And so he will do that. So we're, we're incrementing his mm -hmm. hands slowly. So then he finally gets down to the, he's like, wait a minute, I got my running shoes on, I come home. Why don't I just, you know, just walk? Mm -hmm. So he gets out and, and, he, and he starts walking. So he walks to the whatever mailbox, whatever, back. And then before he knows, he's like, you know, I think I'll jog a little bit. So then he starts jogging. And so then I, 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 I come over and like with him, I would do sometimes weekends, right? So just depending on what the client needs. So I come and I stay for the weekend. And he would be getting his own personal workshop, you know, over the weekend. So I come over with my road bike. I'm a road bike. Like, wow, that looks pretty cool. And so he goes out and he gets a road bike and so he starts, he starts biking, whatever. So we're working on stuff. So then, you know, okay. So we work through a lot of stuff, whatever issues, daddy issues, mommy issues, all those different types of things. And so a couple of years later, I get an email from him. Okay, yo, what's, what's going on, Scotty? Like, well, you know, you know how I was that, you know, overweight person who pretty much didn't want to go out and have this drink, whatever. He's like, uh, I just wanted the senior Mexico Cosmail triathlon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he's like, you know, thank you so much for helping me. And that's why I said, what did your healing do? So we, was that his vision of healing? That was one of his, that was one of his, his visions, right? Well, he wanted to be a bit healthier than he was, wanted to be able to get out of the house and yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so I was just like, yeah, that's 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 how it works, right? But this is the thing though, you have to realize as you know, as a coach, that I think that therapists don't probably get as much because as a coach. I, at least I do. I spend more time with my individuals. And you have to be okay when they're angry at you because that's part of the, the process, right? They have to project whatever. So I remember um, I was helping him doing a workshop weekend with him at his, at his place. And I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there and I'm eating some celery, right? You know how celery is on when you get a crunch at you. <laughs> You've already got the table. Mm -hmm. like, you the hell stop chopping on that <laughs> celery? And I'm like, ooh, there's something. There's, there's, there's something there. I'm like, okay, so let's, let's dive a little bit into it. So I said, so what is it about the celery, you know, that's me, me chewing it? Because some people chew whatever with their mouth open, whatever, and we start diving into it and like, and then he's like, oh, it goes back to my mom it's sitting at the table where they're bread and eating that you weren't supposed to, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it almost came to the point where, you know, me chewing the celery, there was going to be some violent blows going on. Oh, wow. And, and I could see it welling up in him. I just said, bro, I just want to let you know that I studied at the Shaolin Martial Arts China. China, China. 
and it only takes me 1.2 seconds, which is what I need to do. Yeah. Well, then he back, then, then, then he back down, right? He back down, but I could see he was, he was, you know, he was, you know, he was frustrated as well. Yeah, and he didn't, he didn't, he didn't know. We but laugh about that now, you yeah. know. But I love that you asked him, where is this coming from? Yeah. You know, because it's so like, why is this a problem mm -hmm. for me? Yeah. You know? I think it'd be very easy for a lot of people to say, you know, I'm just chewing celery like I thought. Right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. But you have that intuition and that perception to say, okay, what's on your face? And to always ask that. Yeah. I think it's such a great skill that everyone can implement in different ways to like, yeah. usually the thing that you're mad about at someone is usually not that thing. Yeah. Like, if we're all yeah. being very honest with us. Not that person yeah. either. Yeah. yeah. Like, but that's the thing, even as you're healing, that's a question I always ask myself, whether I'm being triggered by something, and I'll ask myself, where's this coming from? Right. And if I've done my work, usually I can answer it. I'm like, oh, that was a dad issue, or blah, 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 blah. This person is not my dad. They're not trying to hurt me, whatever, blah, blah. And so, bam, I might go through my strategies that quick. Bam, we're good. Mm -hmm. Right. So, that's the whole point of teaching individuals those strategies, those tools, so they can actually move through that fast. Through those triggers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we were speaking yesterday and, uh... I always say, like, I feel like we're always healing. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's an ED, like you're healed. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, um, you're healing, you know, until the day you're not here, mm -hmm. right? That's, mm -hmm. that's it. Now, if you're lucky, maybe you get hit by a car and those memories are gone. Oh, you don't have them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like you. But mine are still there. <laughs> so, yeah. Bless me. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, no, they're there and you're constantly, and, and I think that's the hard part a lot of times for guys because some of the things are so subtle, right? And that's because you've been growing up with them all this time. So it just seems like, oh, that's just my quirk. Well, you know, some things are just your personal quirk that come with you, personality, but then some of it isn't. Some of it is ingrained. In yes. There's right. something, there's work to be done. There. Yes. And we're... Always on the journey. Yes. yes. Right. And that's why you're asking questions. Okay, so where's that coming from? Right. And so I was like, okay, well, I used to do that as a kid. Okay, that's fine. But if it's like, oh, after the abuse, I noticed I started doing, oh, okay, mm -hmm. then maybe we have some linking yeah. back to. Right. Yeah. You know, we talked about um, one in six mm -hmm. men are abused. I think that they say one in four women, but we think one that it's three. much one in three. Yeah. But we think it's much more for men yeah. too, and we yeah. think it's closer. Yeah. But the uh, because a lot of people say it's even easier to abuse boys as children than women, than girls because they boys won't talk about it, mm -hmm. won't, won't yeah. give it up. Um, but we, you, you told me the, uh, the other day that twenty. That's twenty five million. Even if it was one in six mm -hmm. men in the U.S., less than four percent go get help. And and you and I both had uh, attempts at suicide. I have a good friend in college who succeeded in suicide because of his abuse. What happens to the other ninety-six percent of, of men? What what's going on? What you know? This is why we do this. Right for one thing, but we aren't reaching all of them. You know, what, what goes on? What, what yeah, do they're, we do to they're save in them? dysfunctional surviving state. Mm. That's, that's pretty much, that's pretty much what it is. They're, they're dysfunctional, but they're surviving because the dysfunction is helping them to survive even though it's not healthy. Right? Mm. So that's one of the reasons when people come and they work with me, I have this, we're celebrating dysfunction. I'm like, what? Well, I mean, we're going to celebrate all the dysfunction, all the stuff. Oh, yeah, I was sleeping around with all. Yep, okay, we're celebrating that. They're like, what? Because I said that kept you alive to the point where now we can actually start working on showing the healthy ways. Wow. Right? So that's a part of me. I, I, can't, I can't get rid of that, so I'm not going to just discard it. And I use, I use kind of the, the tree analogy is that, okay, so in fall time, what happens? So the leaves and things fall off. The tree right so what happens though so those leaves go down they compact they break down they decay and they go back into the soil to start building up the, the tree mm -hmm. so that's what we're doing with our dysfunction and stuff it's dropping and it's falling down it's a part of us and but we're taking it and we're using whatever those nutrients the things that we've learned and we're creating the healthy version of ourselves that we want to see and i think 
you know, I know Mick Craig has talked about it, Laura's talking about it, but Voices Beyond Assault and a safe space for men collaborating mm-hmm. to, I think, you know, we're always better together. If we have yes. a similar mission, if we come together, our voice is louder. Yeah. And I think that us coming together, just even in this podcast, is amazing. Yeah. But we have more to do. Yeah. And uh, together, for men specifically, yeah. you know, um, obviously, it's, we're not biased and we're very inclusive women, non-binary, transgender, yes. men, women, you know, and, you know, I know you said, how can we get this 96%? We're going to have to do something. Yeah. You know, we're going to have to do some major partnerships with organizations that organizations companies sports worlds where they care yeah you know and we can get our voice out to these 96 percent of men and even if we can get four more percent yeah at eight percent we yeah. are doing our job yeah and it's happening yeah just even in this podcast alone because once you know that there's an option things change there's a I can't remember what we call it in, in neuroscience um, but when we talk about trans transformation, and the whole idea is that the expi- the expanded mind never shrinks back to its original size, right? Mm-hmm. So let's just say, for example, an example I use is like, oh, say the FedEx logo, right? So you know the FedEx, right? F E D X, and then I tell people, and you know, often some have noticed and some haven't, right? Say, where's where's the arrow? in the FedEx logo, I'm like what? And then they look at the FedEx logo and you notice between the E and the X mm-hmm. is an arrow, right? It's a little space right there. Right, <laughs> you're like, oh, there's actually an arrow in the FedEx logo, right? Mm-hmm. So now your mind has been expanded. It can't go back to not seeing that, that again, right? That's how insight and, and stuff works, right? And so once you see that, now it's like, okay, so now you know it, so that how do you use it? Right. And so that's the same what we're talking about here. Even if you give people options where they can see that there's more, right, then it never goes back to, well, I don't have any options. Right. Yeah. We are the option. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to go back to the 4% and the 96%. Yeah. Hopefully, some of them are, are watching this program. Hopefully, we've reached them. To, to have some of them, you know, be here today. Um, is it ever too, are you ever, like, I was pretty old when I, when I uh, came to terms with my, uh, in fact, my first therapist that my, uh, a psychologist that my wife found for me to go to, he, I sat in his office and told him my story and he said, you know, you should be over this by now. You're wow. you're 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 old, man. And, and I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? So, that was not helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Know, it was not helpful. Yeah. And then he and then he put me in a room to take these tests with all these other young kids in the room. And I'm like, okay, like, this is crazy. Yeah. So, you know, are you ever too old to start? And no, what we know for men is the average age, and this could be a generational thing, but the average age is somewhere late forties and fifties. When we actually even start coming to terms, working on the things. Now I notice that I'm starting to get clients at a younger, a younger uh, age now, which is great because that means there's more promotion, there's more ever you know talk and things about it. Um, the stigma is lessening a little bit. I'm gonna say with the younger with the younger generations, which is which is great. But I'd still say you know average age. In my groups, forties. Uh, but they think at that age, you know, why? What's the point? I'm like, I don't have that many years left. What's the point? I've been living with it all this long ago. What? What's their? What's? What's the? Yeah, that's the point. You've been living with it, right? So <laughs> that's a, you know, that's that's just a mindset, right? Growth set. So it's like if you want to accept and settle, then yes, that's the mindset that I'll probably will have. But if it's like, no, you know what? There's still more life to live, you know? I really want to have a great relationship with my kids. I really want to have a better relationship with my spouse, my wife, whatever. I really want to build that business that I want to. Mm -hmm. And there's something that's stopping me. It's when you come to that idea and mindset, then that's when things start to take place. Because you're like, okay, so now what are the resources that I need 
to get me to where I want to go, right? That's why this healing vision is just so important. It's like, I even wish that like more therapists would even, so you don't have to coach them, but even just ask the question, you're like, okay, so, you know, let's just say I'm going to work with you for six months. You know, what does your healing vision of you look like after, you know, our time together? It's like, okay, I want to be able to, you know, acknowledge the abuse. And I want to be able to disclose to anyone that I can and still feel comfortable about it. Right. I get a lot, I get a lot of that. Right. And so those are the things, you know, that we, that we work on. Yeah. I love that you said that too. Like, I want to have a better relationship with my spouse or my mm-hmm. kids, but then also wanting to have a better relationship with yourself. Right. You know, you know cause I think that we want everything better for everybody else, yeah. you know, and then we forget about giving ourselves the same love that we so freely give to everyone else, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that healing starts with having a better relationship with yourself yeah. first, you know, acknowledging yeah. like, okay, I'm worthy, right? you know, like I can't keep living with this, you know, so it's never too late yeah. you know it's never too late so i love that you also made a point that most of the people that you work with are at 40 50 mm-hmm. because it's never too late because you're even better for your later years yeah. you know you want to be able to be able to say whatever you want yeah. live free and be open and just take that weight take that backpack off because yeah. you've been carrying a heavy uh, yeah, backpack that 600 for a pound, yeah yeah my yeah. yeah. youngest person i worked with he was 16 no he was 19 so I have to be 19. So he comes to the workshop retreat and, um, you know, we're going through the workshop retreat. And then what happens is his, his parents drop him off. He doesn't know. They, they dropped him off. And then they went on vacation without him. And so they left him there. So it's at the end of the three days. It's the, it's the end of the workshop, right? And I'm like, are there parents coming in? coming to get you and so he finds out that they're on vacation whatever without them and so I'm like well how long are they going to be gone well I guess a couple of weeks I was like okay <laughs> so I said this is what we're going to do I said your workshop is going to continue with me for four weeks you're going to stay with me for four weeks when we're done I'm going to buy you a ticket send you back home and you're going to continue to grow wow. right wow. Wow. and so you know, um, and I'm proud of him because then one of his visions was he wanted to open up yoga studio for survivors. Well, the yoga studio, but he wanted part of it <clears throat> to be for survivors working. We did it. We we built a plan, business plan, for, and he did it. Right. Yeah. You created a safe space for him in the yeah. times because those four weeks could have been very detrimental yeah. to his life after yeah. leaving that workshop and feeling uh feeling abandoned yeah. you know and like after going through that type of heavy work on the weekend mm-hmm. and then like you're abandoned your parents right. are not coming back so for you to create that safe space for him to just be like okay we're going to take these four weeks mm-hmm. to show that you're not abandoned yeah. you have someone here for you yeah and we're going to work through this yeah. and then you can go home and be like it's okay you went on vacation <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, was, I was on a vacation too i was on a healing vacation yeah yeah, yeah. Um, Thomas, we are coming up on a little bit. Do you want to ask, you know, what are some of the, I guess we want to close out with, what is your message to like men survivors? We know that, I know for me, one of the big things that is impetus for me trying to share is not only am I doing this for myself and for people who are older, you know, you're not only doing it for yourself, but you're setting an example for people to come after you. That you are not the kind of person who brushes problems under the rug, that something has been on too long, so you're just going to ignore it. We are not those kinds of people. We as humans, I think we're called to address those problems, to confront them and face them. What would your message be to male survivors? And what is that message that you want to share? So my message always is, first of all, you just have to realize, and this is just me personally speaking, right? So the person that's speaking into this mic right now <laughs> cares about you, okay? This person, you haven't met me, I haven't met you. I guess you can see me even right here. <laughs> <laughs> they know you now. So they know me now, but you need to know that they need to know that there's someone here that loves you. That's the reason I'm sitting here in this chair. And this is the reason I'm sharing the things that I that I do share. And I know that word love is really problematic for us sometimes, you know, as survivors, but know that someone cares about you. And here's the here's the other thing. Wherever that you're going through right now, I just need you, just like I, for me, I need you to hold on for one more day, whatever it is, because the next day, 
might be the day that the healing starts or that the healing comes in, in whatever in whatever form. So know that you're cared about, know that you're loved, and know, of course, that you just got to hold on for one more day, right? Reach out to me, right? Safeplaceforfermen.com. Send me some email. People always remark, they're like, you're the one group or organization that always answers anything. Like I send it to other people and I don't get anything. And I was like, yeah, because to me, if you're sending me email, right, even if I don't have all the answers, I just need to respond and let you know that someone, that someone cares. Acknowledge it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then the three things, what were we talking about yesterday? There was three things that you... Yes. Yes. So my, that's my, so my motto is this after all these years, one, and so release the past. Okay. So, I mean, release the past, right? So we don't have to be sitting in session talking about it for five years. <laughs> release the past, right? And then embrace the future, right? But to embrace the future, you've got to see the future. Where do you want to be? Who do you want to, to be? What does your life look like? And then this is the most important because this kind of completes the picture, you know, once you've released it and you've embraced the future, you got to have community. So you got to get love and connection, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons that when we do our coaching stuff, we try to do it in communities. So you know that there's a place where at least you're going to get some love and some connection. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. I am so happy that you are our first live podcast. <laughs> I'm going to hug you and um, get to know you. You're doing such great work. Yeah, feel free. Have me back whenever. Oh, well, first of all, we're I, partnering. Yeah. yeah. Another yeah. Yeah, this is not the end. This, this is not the end. This is just the beginning, okay? Coach yeah. <laughs> T, thank you so much for joining our program for our first live program. Yeah. yeah. All of you here. Um, for sharing your incredible story of triumph, sharing your methods, your strategies, your stories of success, and your beautiful mantras as well. We know you are on a path to continue to help so many survivors, and we're so thankful for all the work that you're doing. And uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Next time I'll share with you guys my Shaolin <laughs> story about living at the Shaolin Temple. Right? Sure. <laughs> It, it would be through a retreat there. We will for sure want you back here yeah. in this space. And and uh, we're just really thankful. And I, I tell you, we'll have a lot of information at the end of this program about how to get in touch with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know everybody should be calling you. <laughs> and uh, and the, the workshops, uh, you'll have a schedule out mm -hmm. soon that you'll yeah. be able to get through your website. And I am going to be first in line <laughs> to tell you. I, uh, it's just been such a pleasure getting to know you. I really appreciate you coming down. And, and thank you, everybody, who... Uh, is joining us here today and, and found our, our, our YouTube cast or our, our podcast. You'll find this and, and lots of, of enlightening conversations like this uh, on the voicesbeyondassault.com or Voices Beyond Assault. Uh, search for that on any podcast site or YouTube site. And we Instagram hope you, as well. Uh, yeah, we <laughs> continue to join us for these because we do these for you guys as well, but we get a lot out of it too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah we really do. And, and finally, thank you, Brianna, for joining us today. It was wonderful yeah, to have you. It's a completely different energy, and we love yeah, to have it. Right. You've done a lot of stuff to set our first live in person, yeah. all the connections, all the people you're connecting with, and continue to support survivors and create this wonderful nonprofit that we're all able to be a part of and so thank you so much and it's we are all voices beyond assault mm -hmm. and we are using our voice to change lives and power survivors and to work on healing past our yeah. trauma what do you call us thrivers yes for thrivers the thrivers <laughs> and we'll end on that all right thanks so much thank you so much we'll okay. see you soon Hands on my chin, I was lost and looking in the glass of time. Was it just the wine made me cry? I hope I'm satisfied. I saw myself an older man folding up his paper plans and hiding it in his hands. Made me say, Am I? Say too late tomorrow
tomorrow Too late tomorrow My face crashed down As I had a look around Amongst the crowd It wasn't really there And I 